Welcome back. Today we're going to be taking a look at Dev Diary number 65, which is a, allegedly the second Dev Diary released since the release of the game. I think they released one where they were going to talk about the trajectory of the game and they said they were going to develop military, but here they are talking about, about patch 1.1, which is going to be the first major patch and things they're going to implement. Hello and welcome to the second post-release uh, Dev Diary for Victoria 3. Today we'll be talking about the first major post-release patch we'll be aiming at getting done before the end of the year. Primarily focusing on uh, game polish, bug fixing, and balancing AI improvements, UI, and UX work. This is probably my biggest complaint about the game so far, is that the UI uh, is um, both uh, difficult to manage as well as being opaque. A lot of times you want to access certain information and you can't, um, and this is kind of something that I think should be solved, and this is what they're working on, which I think is great. Uh, the first of these is actually one of my biggest complaints, is a change, is a rework of the interface for individual pops with a particular emphasis on improving the visualization of pop needs. Currently, in order to look at what your pops are consuming and how much they're consuming of it and the prices of it, along with that, you actually need to uh, hover over their quality of life and then that brings down a tooltip and then you need to hug, hover over their current uh, QOL for the different the particular group and that puts down a tooltip and then you need to hover over the percentage uh, they're paying on average and then that pops out what they're consuming, how much, and what they're paying for it. So you need to open up three tooltip menus in order to just see what is one of the most important inf pieces of information in the game because if you want to improve quality of life the easiest way to go about doing it is reducing the price of goods of that they're primarily consuming. Okay. In addition to the general overview, now there are separate tabs for economy and consumption. Um, I think this is fantastic. Uh, I think a lot of people, like, um, they get lost on, or they don't fully appreciate how much consumption drives the economy in Victoria 3. It's not just about producing goods, you also have to create demand for goods and consumption of goods. Like, one of the reasons that um, construction is, like, so powerful in Victoria 3 is it not only uh, gives you more production, but it is also a way you can drive consumption because you are consuming the goods you use for uh, the building. And I think that uh, finding an equilibrium of consumption or production, sorry, construction is really important because, um, you know, you don't want to turn your construction queue off because that slows down your economy. Your construction queue is creating demand for all of the goods you use in your construction queue. So if you have the level one construction centers, you know, it's creating demand for fabric and wood. When you turn it off, you make your fabric and wood places less profitable. And you know, you you if construction is the biggest government expense, you actually slow down your economy a lot when you turn it off. And so like, um, consumption is a big part of the game. It is not reflected in the UI at all as a big part of the game. And so I think that this is great, uh, even if it's just on pops and not just on, uh, and not on um, consumption of various kinds where you're like looking at, you know, uh, chains and trees of um, goods being consumed or like how much wood is consumed and how much wood is consumed in like various, like by the pops, by industries, by export and like this sort of thing. Okay. Showing detailed breakdown of all goods expenditures along with pricing information and state of the market. I'm hoping this includes not just pop consumption. We also plan to further, uh, plan to iterate pop needs further to give future idea of where the populations are going idea of what your population needs are countrywide. If you take a look um, here, this is much improved, where they have this uh, top five goods expenditures, how much, and they have the, the silver indicating like how, what the price is. I wish there was uh, a little bit better in terms of, um, you know, uh, visualizing like how expensive they are other than the silver, which does visually show, but like I'd rather have a number, um, you know, and it's, giving you a much better idea of pop income like all this stuff is information you would like want to have especially like uh dependence versus workforce like all this information is really valuable because it helps you make decisions about like economies long term that you couldn't normally make okay let's scroll through and here's another one this is exactly what i was talking about a about what I was wanting. So the economy tab 
gives you a little bit about the good expenditures, but this talks about consumption in particular, and this is perfect. You know, they're giving you uh, what they're consuming in terms of like what they're spending their money on and how expensive it is. And so now it's easier to access this information. You could access it before, but it's uh, the UI is just very opaque in a lot of ways. Um, and this is improving on perhaps the most important because what you would do in like this type of country to increase standard of living is uh, build, focus on grain, liquor, and clothes and furniture, right? Um, and so services can be a little, a little hard to um, create a lot more of early on. Okay, the next significant change in uh, 1.1 is the rework of legitimacy. Perfect. Right now, all legitimacy does is help you pass laws. Once you have all the laws you want in place, which like happens like 30% into a run, like the first 30 to 40 years, uh, it's like worthless. It doesn't do anything. Some frequent criticisms that we have received from about the political system in Victoria 3 is that legitimacy doesn't matter enough, exactly, and it isn't clear enough about its effects, as well as that elections don't have in, enough of an impact. This is perfect, because a lot of times, I don't even, like, try, I, I don't even care about who wins the election, um, I kind of care about which pops, like, have clout, but, like, it, it, once you pass all the laws you want, the clout becomes insignificant, who has which amount of clout, or it becomes relatively insignificant. Now, if a group has a lot of clout and they are pushing for, like, uh, there's a political movement, it matters, but uh, by and large, it, it just feels like you, you reach this point where you have the laws you want, and then you just stop caring about interest groups, which, like, the most fun aspect of the game is the, the interplay between uh, interest groups, economics, and production. Okay. This rework aims to resolve all this problem by making several changes. First, legitimacy, uh, still a number that goes from 0 to 100, is divided into five categories with differing effects, some of which will increase or decrease based on the actual numbers and not just the threshold. So, first, 0 uh, to 24, illegitimate government. This government is considered blatantly illegitimate by most everyone in the country. The legitimacy uh, reduces the approval of all opposition IGs, which notably, this is not enough of a malice, because if you can include all the uh, IGs in government, which I quite end up doing with like parliamentary uh, republic, uh, there's no oppo anymore. Um, uh, it makes it impossible to unlock laws, and generates a steady stream of increased radicals based, or uh, of radicals in increased numbers, uh, the lower the legitimacy is. So this extra uh, stream of radicals is important because. Uh, if, you, if you're not trying to pass laws, then you just put everyone in the government and then you don't have the oppo malice, um, the opposition malice. So this is another thing where like um, you uh, running an authority deficit is not bad currently if you have all the in interest groups in government, which you shouldn't be able to have all the interest groups in government or it should, the, the, what, when you have all the interest groups in government, it tanks the legitimacy. So maybe this isn't even enough. If, it, it depends on what the steady stream of radicals is exactly, but this uh, probably improves parliamentary republic as a law quite a bit. All right, 24, 25 to 49, unacceptable government. The government is uh, generally considered not acceptable to the people of the country. Laws can be enacted, but opposition all G, uh, IGs will disprove and radicals will be created over time, though in amounts less than an illegitimate government. Okay, so this sounds like the same version, but light. Okay, so 50 to 74, contested government. Uh, the government seems to have somewhat shaky foundations. Opposition IGs will disprove slightly, but otherwise no, uh, there are no ill or good effects. Okay, this seems straightforward. Uh, neutral is, as it were. Legitimate government. This government is considered proper and legitimate over time. A small number of loyalists will be generated with increased numbers, the higher legitimacy is. Perfect, so now you have uh, an incentive to have high legitimacy, which you did not previously once you passed all your laws. It also encourages you, perhaps, um, to avoid revolutions and to try and um, shift things more slowly. Currently, it seems to be the case, and I'm not 100% sure on this because I haven't done enough runs, uh, it seems to be the case that uh, revolutions aren't really that bad, and what you can just do is you, uh, you just spark a revolution, you crush it, and then you get rid of all the radicals. Uh, which seems a bit excessive, or like it, it seems just too easy to get rid of like all the bad thing because you just like get rid of all the radicals and you get rid of all the clout and you just get like a fresh start and you get to pass a bunch of reforms. Revolutions kind of seem a little good right now and I, I think that, that maybe they should seem a little bad. Okay. Um, like uh, perhaps war should create more dependence and like uh, the 
it creates like a lagging negative effect that's uh, hard to reconcile. Okay, uh, 90 to 100, this government's legitimacy is considered unassailable. In addition to generating loyalists, enactment time for new laws is cut in half. That's powerful, uh, but it's not powerful. Mm, I have some mixed feelings. I don't think this does enough to, it doesn't see, sound like this is going to do enough to address the fact that like once you have all the laws you want, legitimacy is still not a very important thing. Um, but uh, the, the creation of radicals when it's low and loyalists when it's high, it perhaps, it depends on the numbers if this is uh, good. Okay, the way you gain legitimacy has been altered in democracies with a share of votes rather than uh, just the clout representing uh, representing the government now having direct effect of, on legitimacy, the degree to which depends on the laws. Under more restrictive voting systems, clout can still be more important than votes. Okay, this is very interesting. Um, this will require some playing around with. Um, currently, as it stands, uh, you... It seems to be the case... I've been playing around a bit with uh, some of the different laws you can do that alter how like legitimacy is calculated, and I've currently been playing around a bit with oligarchy, which actually seems pretty good if you just want to keep the industrialists really strong. Um, but this um, making votes matter a lot more, I think, is uh, going to be uh, make it so that the, the, the system seems a lot more dynamic, because if the votes matter more, um, then it... You won't be able to just like lock in everything, your laws and all this, and then just keep going. Like right now, it feels like you lock in your laws, and then you just <laughs> you stop caring about the political thing entirely. Uh, if the if the votes really matter, then what seems to be and uh, having low legitimacy will create radicals. Um, then it seems to be the case that uh, you can just. Uh, Sorry, if the votes really matter and having low legitimacy creates radicals, um, then you have to care about who wins the elections. Except, if you already have all your laws in place, then you just put in the government that won the election, and then you just keep going with the laws. So there still needs to be like some type of malice for having whatever groups in government. Um, if you have a bunch of groups in government that oppose all the laws you have, there has to be some additional malice, I think, you know, to avoid you from just like hitting all the laws you want and then stop caring about politics. But okay. Um, but as more as the population becomes enfranchised, vo uh, votes grow importance, and under universal suffrage, it should be Im virtually impossible for a government that doesn't have its voters behind it to be considered legitimate. Okay, this is perfect. Um, lastly for today, we're, we've also made a change to balancing church and state uh, citizenship laws. Uh, currently, it seems to be the case that uh, the primary benefit of a uh, Going, adding more church to the country is uh, authority and not a very large amount of authority. And um, the penalty is you uh, for having extra religion is increased discrimination, which gets uh, bad depending on. Basically, if you have an, a, a country that is entirely one religion, it's not a big deal, but migration seems to be a great way to get uh, pops. Um, migration seems really, really, really powerful. And if you are relying on migration, then you want to have a uh, very tolerant religious laws. So it, it seems to be the case that um, you generally want uh, total separation over state religion, um, generally speaking. Previously, the only balancing consideration for these laws was that less tolerance gave more authority, Yeah, which we felt was neither particularly balanced nor uh, complete representation of the reason that a country might want to discriminate against part of their population. This is a huge thing. Um, it seems that uh, discriminating against your population, it doesn't seem to be a very strong strategy at this current juncture, um, because what it does is it creates pops that are mad, and it creates, like, uh, it stratifies the economy, and um, it seems to me, at least at this point, that um, creating a heavily stratified economy is not, um, does not have especially large bonuses uh, that outweigh increasing standard of living uh, such that you can attract migration. So what I mean by that is um, currently it seems to be the case that uh, so if you if you heavily stratify your economy and keep like some people in the lower class and some people in a really high upper class, um, there doesn't seem to be a payout for this, but there seems to be a very large payout for increasing quality of life for everyone or the average quality of life because it attracts a ton of migration. And when you have a ton of migration, you're going to have way more workers. And so 
overall you get more workers by paying them a lot more because you just suck the pops out of the rest of the world. Um, and uh, in order to facilitate this, you don't want discrimination. Okay. To try and address this, uh, we've made it so that by default, slightly less, uh, slightly more radicals are created by standard of living decreases than uh, loyalists from standard of living increases. Interesting. But offset this with modifiers on a more restrictive laws that increase loyalists and slightly reduce radical gain amongst the accepted parts of the population. The more restrictive your cultural and religious tolerance, the greater the effect of the part of the population that actually falls within it. Okay, this seems perfect. Because, like, I was doing a Japan run, and Japan's almost entirely uh, Japanese, and um, whatever their starting religion is, at least at the start. And so it seems to be the case that, uh, let's see what the bonus is, plus 10% radicals from standard living decreases in accepted religion, or uh, plus 10% loyalists from standard uh, of living decreases in accepted religions. So this is great, that they're, they're adding more of a, a benefit uh, for, um, you know, being exclusionary. Still, it seems that migration is really powerful. Um, I, I think if I'm min-maxing, I'm still probably going total separation unless I have a, an enormous population to start and a reason not to. So maybe like uh, China and Japan, where Japan's not even open for migration at the start anyways. I mean, you probably get your migration laws going before you do total separation, but um, it still seems to me that uh, this is not... Um, I mean, you could just scale up the bonus if it's 100%, that, that, that seems like... A pretty big deal, you know, but okay. That's it for today. Next week we're going to continue to talking about patch 1.1, which I said at the beginning of the Dev Diaries, uh, plan to be released before the end of the year, so quick turnaround. Um, you know, I know that uh, on my um, review I had a lot of negative things to say. I think there's a lot of, like, stuff that can be fixed relatively quickly because a lot of it is, like, UI just feeling terrible, like, in particular. Uh, you know, the, the not having access to this is probably the biggest complaint. A second is um, when navally landing and it says it doesn't have enough support and it doesn't tell you what support is, whether it's convoys or more ships or just a bigger army, like that's um, another one that really uh, wrinkles me. But overall, these seem to be, uh, in my mind, excellent changes. Um, and I'm excited to see that these are not the only changes. This is just part one of this patch. And so uh, I'm excited to see part two. I'm hoping part two uh, is fixing in particular like some military and Diplo stuff. I complained about it in my last video. Uh, the like, So the big ones are the alliance systems uh, seem particularly broken. I didn't mention it in my last video, but uh, you can't start multiple wars at once or you can't be like if you're in a Diplo, if you're, if you're in a Diplo play that you started, you cannot start another one. And if you're in a war, you can't start another one. And this includes, um, like, when natives uprise against you. And so it's really annoying when you have, like, a native uprising, and then you're in the war, and then uh, you, like, you beat them, and then you have to wait several months for them to capitulate. And so sometimes you're just stuck in a year where you can't declare a war, even though it'd be a really good time because someone's, like, stuck in another war, um, or stuck in a revolution. Uh, and so uh, this is... <laughs> This is not like a realistic representation of anything, um, and so uh, I assume they do it for like balance reasons or stuff like this, but I'm hoping that stuff like that gets fixed, as well as um, making uh, the, the Navy stuff more transparent, as well as making some of the fighting stuff more transparent, and perhaps balancing some stuff a little bit uh, differently, uh, but that's like kind of, that's minor. Um, also improvements to the AI. The AI is really bad at punishing certain things and like uh, can be really passive in spot and some way too aggressive in spots. In particular, like you can kind of just delete all your military at the start of the game in a lot of starts and um, the AI won't punish you for it. And so being able to not pay the military and instead do a bunch of construction centers uh, lets you get rolling like really, really fast. Um, and so stuff like this, but I'm very excited about this legitimacy thing, uh, because the most exciting part of the game is the interplay. In, in my in my estimation, the most important part of the... or the the most exciting part of the game is the interplay between production, um, laws, and, uh, what is it, uh, like, interest groups and, like, 
uh, the way that different pops and different jobs like uh, affect all this and they all, they all interact. And uh, this kind of just disappears once you have all your laws in place because you don't care anymore. And so this seems like a good step towards doing that. Um, but I don't think it's enough. I think that they also have to add like an extra layer where it's like, um, you know, if in addition to having an illegitimate government being bad, if you uh, swap in a legitimate government and the illegitimate government entirely wants to undo old reforms, then it should be hard for you to keep the old reforms. And so you can't just like swap in the legitimate government and just not reform anything. Uh, something like this uh, also seems like a, a good look and a good shout. Um, anyways, we'll see how things go. Uh, if you like this video, free feel to like, comment, subscribe, do the YouTube algorithm stuff, and uh, if you want any suggestions or any like sort of, I'm going to start doing tutorial videos. Um, if there's anything in particular you uh, wanted to um, learn more about, feel free to drop it in the comments and I will probably do a video on it um, if there aren't too many suggestions. Anyways, have a good one.